This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at Salesforce.com/products/service. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels. Guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at clavio.com/spotify. That's k-l-a-v-i-y-o.com/spotify. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. Where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Rami Ali Gio. About why HR matters beyond just covering your butt. Rami Ali Gio, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you today. So you're joining us from Memphis. I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about why HR matters beyond just covering your butt. And, you know, as we were preparing for this episode, that was something that you threw out there. I, I thought that was a really fun way to put it. And of course, legal compliance, labor and, and employment law compliance, that's all very important. Uh, but are we only setting up our people processes in a way to stay compliant and cover our butts in case of lawsuits, or are we actually doing it in a proactive way uh, to actually attract and retain great people and to motivate and engage and, and to really leverage the potential of our people? And I think they're two fundamentally different philosophies, not mutually exclusive, but Absolutely. in my experience, most organizations that tend to be more of a compliance-based culture, they tend to be based more in fear and they don't tend to do 
some of those other strategic proactive things very well. So that's what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Rami's bio with everybody. Rami and his wife, Elizabeth, are the owners of People Processes, provider of integrated automated HR processes. Rami and his team work with hundreds of companies across the United States, helping them learn how to stop pushing paper and start prioritizing people. In addition, Rami serves on the Federal Reserve Industry Council on Healthcare, providing insights to employer costs and how they affect business in today's marketplace. He holds a bachelor's degree in financial economics and an MBA with a focus on economics. His book, People Processes, was a number one Amazon bestseller in the HR category and one of Inc.com's top 10 leadership books in 2018. What a tremendous background, Rami. It's a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with my listeners by way of your background and personal context before we dive on in further? Well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to economics. But what I do day to day is HR, and I love the intersection of those two, of data analysis and figuring out why people do what they do with limited resources and how that can apply to HR. Liz and I, uh, my, is my, Liz is my wife. We've worked together every day of our lives since we were 16 years old um, and have managed to grow a pretty successful business together, working right next to one another. Uh, so I often get some really fun questions about uh, working with your spouse every day, too. I think that informed a lot of my HR policies. Labor economics is a really important area of HR. So I think that that uh, economics background is really important. And like we said, you know, the, the legal compliance components, I, we're not dismissing that. That's important. Every organization right. needs to focus on regulations and compliance with various mandates. Uh, no don't question about that. An important part of business. Don't go to jail. Don't, don't yeah. go to jail. But if that's like our top focus, I think we're missing the boat. Uh, and there's so much more that we can do. And, and if we're doing all the other strategic things that we're going to be talking about today, I think the compliance stuff will also take care of itself. Um, and, and so we can certainly try to do both. Uh, so, so I think that's wonderful. Your, your economics background, fantastic uh, to bring to the table as we talk about um, HR as a business partner and, and a, a, having a strategic seat at the table to talk about all the big business issues within an organization. So what I like to do with my clients is first get them to change their mindset around employees um, in a large way. HR has many functions, as we mentioned, don't go to jail, jail, very bad. We don't want to do that. Um, but beyond that, HR serves as a multiplier on the labor that you spend. Uh, you, the labor is often the number one expense in a business. It's not in every business and less, less so as we move into a technologically driven world, but it's still a huge part of it. And being able to get a higher return on those dollars from an economics perspective is a huge part of HR's role. It's not just covering your butt, it's serving as a force multiplier for your labor. Another kind of mind shift that people, uh, I think, often are, are harmed by is thinking of their employees as anything less than a client. A lot of companies have hundreds of clients and five employees. And yet when they lose one of their clients, they all look around to one another, they call a meeting and say, why did we lose them? Did we promise something wrong? Did we execute poorly? Did we set, our ex did we set their expectations inappropriately? What did we do wrong in our sales process, in our implementation process that has caused us to lose this client. Maybe it was just pure qualification. They were a bad client to start with. We never should have taken them on. Okay, but you don't let yourself just go with that forever. You go back and go, what do we need to do to make sure we don't bring a client on like that in the future? HR employees is the same way. It's a process-driven environment where when things go wrong, all I want business owners to do is take a minute and go, where in the process of marketing, we call that recruiting, qualification, that's interviewing, onboarding, which is very similar to client implementation, goal setting or setting expectations. Where did we go wrong? Are we overcharging, under delivering? What are we doing wrong? And using that to inform their processes in the future. It doesn't have to be a black box of, well, that dude was just an idiot. That's why we had to fire him. Like, well, if he was an idiot, why'd you hire him? All right, you did something wrong. So HR is this process of 
continually looking at that life cycle of employees and making improvements so that you get to get more out of labor and hopefully have lower turnover, better employees, higher motivation, all those sorts of things, just like you would on a client focused process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that approach. Um, so having a customer or client centric approach towards your people, uh, it, it can be a very healthy way to go about doing it. And, and I like to just talk in general about having a people centric approach in an organization. Uh, and, and that means we are hyper focused on the consumer experience, we are hyper focused on the employee experience. And we want to make sure that all the systems and the processes, all the, the policies, practices and procedures within the organization yes align and that they support what you're actually trying to to accomplish the strategic ends of the organization and again it doesn't it's not a mutually exclusive thing a lot of times i think some business leaders especially those who may come from more of a finance background they may see hr like you said it's 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 one of the most expensive parts of an organization so they see it as a cost center they see it as a sinkhole of cost (laughs) and (laughs) and because because of that kind of starting point uh, in, in their approach and their mentality towards HR, uh, I, I think they, they, they don't want to put any more money into it than they need to. And so this whole idea of, of employee experience is often lost on a certain segment of leaders who just simply say, you know what, we offer the job, employees need to come, they need to do the work. If they don't like it, they can leave and we'll just fill the job with somebody else. Well, in a certain economy, that might have worked. But in today's yeah. economy and today's labor market, that's not going to work. And, and frankly, it hasn't really worked in a long time. And, and you're just going to be shooting yourself in the foot repeatedly. You're, gonna, you're not going to attract great people. You're going to lose your best people. And, and ultimately, uh, you have to invest in your people, just like you would invest in any form of capital or asset in the organization, just like you would invest in the technology or the equipment or you know, for upkeep and, and, and uh advances and and such. You need to do the same thing with your people. And if you don't, you're going to miss out. Well, I I think one of the reasons people feel that way is they miss a very important lesson from economics. Um, You may have heard of Pareto optimality. Maybe you haven't. A lot of businesses call that the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule, right? 90% of your revenue comes from 10% of your clients. Say 80% of your problems come from 20% of your employees. You read this in every business book ever. The actual rule is significant. It always bothered me when I was in business school. Some people said 80-20 and some said 90-10. And I was like, why? 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 This is a big difference. And it actually comes from this economics rule, uh, Pareto optimality. And it's a great, great finding. Um, and it, and, it, and it really applies to everything. It applies to the growth rate of cities. It applies to the growth rate of stars. Uh, anytime you have the allocation of resources over a complex system, this rule applies. And it's not as simple as 80-20 or 90-10. It's actually got a little bit of math to it, but the bottom line is the more inputs you have, so if there are 100 clients, the square root of that number, 10, provide half 50% of your revenue, okay? So double that 20 and you're getting to about two standard deviations. That's where you get your 90-10 rule or your 80-20 rule. Um, at 100 clients, the 80-20 rules apply. At 1,000 clients, 33 of your clients provide half of your revenue, right? Or 66 provide about 80% and 100 provide about 90%. That's where we get the 90-10. You have 1,000 inputs, you get the 90-10, you have 100, you get the 80-20. This applies to your employees. When you have 10 employees, three and a half of them are worth half your business. That sounds about right. You look at, you get a 10 employee shop, look around, three or four of you are carrying the load. Six are there, they're doing fine. Hopefully you have good performance management and you've gotten rid of the bad ones, but you know a small portion of them are so important. When you have 100 employees, the same happens to 10 people, maybe 20 are worth half your business. One of the problems is you don't necessarily know which 10 or 20 of those are. HR as a process allows you to improve the outcomes, but one of the reasons it's so difficult for finance people to see is because you're actually playing on the margins for that 10% that's worth 90% of your company. 
at a thousand person level or the 20 employees that's worth 80% of your company at a hundred uh, employee level. You don't necessarily know who they are. They're carrying more than half of the value of your company, if not 80 or 90% of it. And when you screw up in HR, when you make PTO stupid, when you provide bad benefits in comparison to your uh, competitors, you never lose that idiot you've wanted to fire but just can't bring yourself to do. You always lose the top talent and they're not one one hundredth of your business. That they're, is so true. They're a huge part of it because they're the ones with options. When you're thinking, when you're a finance person thinking I'm investing a million dollars in payroll, I sure would like to cut that to 900000 The problem is that 100000 bucks you're losing isn't going to be spread across your employee pool. It's going to be hit on certain people, and you don't necessarily know which ones are your great load bearers inside your organization. And that's why you see huge companies that are venture funded with a thousand employees, they crash so quickly because mm. something goes wrong. And it's not that half their staff leave, it's that 20 of their staff leave. And it's the 20 that are carrying half the business. And suddenly a billion mm -hmm. dollar company is worth 500 million. It happens yeah. all the time. So HR is a process driven thing where you're trying to improve the outcomes, just like you do in sales, just like you do in marketing, just like you do in operations. But the purpose you're playing for that small percentage of talent in the market that really has an outsized impact inside your organization. Yeah, that is a, a fantastic way of framing that up. And I, I appreciate the explanation of the 80-20 or the 90-10 rule because I've never heard it explained from an economics point of view and that makes complete sense. Uh, that and and that's been my experience too. Uh, that that you you tend to see that kind of a distribution um, in in the carrying of the weight of an organization, and and it really is. It, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. Check out my new book, The Future Leader: Creating and Transforming Next Gen organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, the future leader will help you explore the ordinary everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy, courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. How much leaders can take for granted, they're really great people. And sometimes it's because they don't really know the difference. They don't know how to tell who's the great ones and who's, um, who's not great. Sometimes there's ego involved. Sometimes they're insecure about it. They're threatened by the great ones. And so they'd rather surround themselves with people that they're better than instead of people that will elevate them in the organization. Both of those things happen. But regardless of the reason, when you have good people leave, it is going to really hurt the business. And so we have to make sure that our processes are in, good play, in a good place. And, and so I guess that's the question is when do we when do employers, when do leaders need to start really taking a good hard look at their people processes? Um, because I would imagine we don't want to wait until we've lost, 
you know, that 20% right. that are, are carrying all the weight. Absolutely. And I get, quite, I get that, that asked a lot. I, I look at businesses as three in three broad life cycles, and there's probably more later on, but among my clients that have between 20 and a thousand employees, this is what I see. Step one in a business is don't suck at your job. If you have a bad product or it's inappropriately, if you have the same product as everyone else, you have no pricing control over it. So you're offering it at the same price as everyone else. And there's nothing differentiating about you. You have a lot of work to do. And the truth is you're not going to scale up to need a bunch of employees anyway. You're going to be a two-man CPA shop with you and your gal Friday. No problem. You can make a great living that way. But until you actually have a product or a service that is differentiated, that you can deliver personally well, that fulfills a, a need of the market, you don't have much to do. So step one, you got to not suck at your job. That's how I put that. There's probably a better way to put it, but... Most companies fail at that role. That's the 90% that never make it. They never figure out where in the market they're supposed to be and what they need to do. Once they get there, you get to the e-myth revisited kind of world. You get to standard operating procedures. You realize I've got a great pie. People want it. I can produce it for $3. I can sell it for $15. I make money. And suddenly you have to scale up. At that point, you have to create operating procedures. You have to have a recipe that can be followed every time. And that level of business is already a difficult enough place for many small business for many small businesses to get to. I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that in their head, though. They understand they have to create processes and systems to deliver their service or product. The thing is, as you get bigger, new things happen more and more often. Suppliers discontinue, regulations change, uh, new competitor enters the marketplace that you've never seen before. When it's just you and your local town, it's your local bakery, you may only really need to worry about operating procedures and being able to fill in your seven staff and you can live with it. But as you start to scale, new things will happen every day where operating procedures don't answer the question. It happened in my business. I wound up going, you know, I had, I had, I had seven employees, eight employees. We were growing. Everything was great. We had a great product. They did they did exactly as, was, as the operating procedures listed. And every day there would be a new thing that comes up that would have to go to me or Liz. And at one point we got a great new client. We, we, we won a huge bid, 13,000 locations. The sales guy came in. We I said, buying everybody lunch, high five. Liz and I went into the conference room and bawled our eyes out. We have no freaking clue what we're going to do. Because as you scale and grow, new things happen all the time, which means operating procedures can't answer the question, which means you need people besides just you, the business owner, who can make decisions that are correct. Not just make decisions, but do it right. And right varies in every organization. People processes is this overarching structure that allows you to take someone from an enthusiastic new hire who's happy to be here to someone you can trust to make the decision you would have made, but without asking you about it. And that process is one that I, I feel like when people start realizing that they can't deal with anything other than the bog standard ordinary in and out of their business is when you've got to start thinking about developing a structure that creates people as opposed to creating a product. If you can create, mm -hmm. invest your in entrepreneurialism in yeah. not, I change tires. Step two, I create processes for people to follow to change tires. Mm -hmm. Step three, I create people who create the processes to change tires. You're going that one right. layer back and that allows you to scale and grow. If you're ever out there as an entrepreneur making promises and you're thinking in the back of your head, my team is not going to be able to handle this. I'm freaking out, man. I've got the opportunity in front of me, but I'm scared the team behind me isn't going to make it. That's where you've got to stop, turn around and think inward, think inside your business to build that up. And it may be an operational issue, but more than likely, once you hit even a minimal level of scale, it's a people issue, not an operations issue. Yeah. Yeah. And what does it, so what does it look like then when you start to see a high functioning, high performing uh, HR team, HR department within your scaling organization? <clears throat> Good question. 
the, the primary difference between a, a well-functioning HR department and what I would consider what a lot of small businesses have is one invests their time, effort, energy, and budget in improving the processes that interact with the employees, whereas the other spends their time doing it. If you look, if you say, oh, I've got an HR person, or I've got three HR people, and then you go look at what they do, and 95% of their time is spent filling out paper or chasing down employees to get the paper, or you put the hire date in the date of birth field. And I have to, I hired somebody. Now it's going to be 12 hours of me submitting it to each insurance carrier and the payroll company and the retirement company and the security company and getting them a laptop. You don't have an HR department, you got an administrative department. There's nothing wrong with it. You may, you need day-to-day -day processes, probably a better way to do it. There's computers now, but whatever, you can spend it on labor. I don't mind that, but you are not doing HR until you have someone coming to you and saying, I want to change how we advertise for, for new talent. I want to change our interview structure. I want to change how we onboard new talent. I want to change how we reward talent, benefits, and compensation. I want to change how we monitor the performance of our talent. And hopefully, eventually, I want to change how we fire or offboard people. All of those are key functions in HR, and someone thinking about improving those is the only way that you're going to actually get a well-functioning and, and return on investment. It's not just a financial sink of paperwork and molasses of day-to-day -day monkey work. You got So if you look around your business right now and you realize no one is thinking about improving the HR, you know you don't have an HR department. Yeah, and everything you're you're just describing there, that's kind of the old school transactional HR approach, yep. right? The old personnel department or even the HR department of 20 years ago. And what we need is is transformational HR. We need HR full of change agents that can support. Uh, leaders throughout the organization, uh, especially with the hard, really challenging people related issues that come up in organizations. And that's, that's really what we need in a high functioning HR team. And if, like you said, if you're stuck in the day to day transactional stuff, or the compliance stuff, not that those things aren't important, they are. But you got to get past that. that, that can't be your number one focus. Uh, you have to be focusing on on the other higher level strategic efforts uh other otherwise like we said earlier you, you're just not gonna you're not gonna be an employer of choice you're not gonna have an employee experience that attracts good people and you're gonna yeah. you're gonna not get the the top talent and then even those who are the high performers in your organization they're going to either leave or they're going to be looking for opportunities to leave and mentally check out while they're still there and either it's way wasting it's, so much of your money yeah i mean either way it's a huge problem yeah, if you think about it again, because I do this a lot because business owners and executives can think in sales and marketing so easily. They don't think in HR. Imagine that you spent the money it takes for you to get a client that's worth a tenth of your business. This is your tenth hire in the in the analogy, guys. Okay. But there's your tenth, your your new client, one tenth of your business. You've marketed across the entire market. You've interview, you've, you've done uh, uh, significant sales calls, multiple steps of the sale. You've, you've presented to them a solution for them and you closed them. And then you mailed them 45 black and white pages that are kind of off kilter on the photocopy. And I'm like, cool, here's your product. Um, contact me if you have any problems. Oh, you have questions? Ask, you can just call in and talk to Steve if you have any questions at any time. You would never treat a client that way. Or if you did, you would spend so much money getting new clients all the time because you'd be turning over them all the time. They'd be coming in and going, wait, what, what, what did I sign up for? Hang on. You have much more immediate feedback because the client's going to call you up and go, you, what the hell is this? Can I at least get color copies? Like, what are we doing here? Bottom line, treat your employees like you would at a client that's actually matters to you. It's going to save you a lot of time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I don't think we can hit that point home enough because it, it really seems like a no brainer to us, but it gets lost so often within organizations, in those board meetings uh, and in those conference rooms. 
And, you know, when, when times are tough, one of the first things that always gets cut or scaled back is the HR, the training, the talent development, the, all of those, those components. And on the one hand, I kind of get where they're coming from. But on the other hand, it's, it's just super short-sighted. You might be able to save money in the short term. It's going to cost you in the long term. And so let's try to take a long-term approach. Well, Rami, it has just been a pleasure. I note the time and I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. Well, check us out at peopleprocesses.com. Uh, there you can sign up for our academy if you're a small business and maybe want to train someone on your staff to give them a good overview of what they need to be working on. Uh, or contact us directly if you'd like people processes to help your HR directly. We, we actually serve as HR departments for smaller businesses and support staff for larger ones. Check us out at peopleprocesses.com. You can also find my book, People Processes, on amazon.com. Grab a copy, write to me. Uh, my email address is in the book. And every email that comes in, I respond to. So check that out. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you so much, Rami. It has just been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Rami and his team can do for you and how you can really up your game with your people processes. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. 
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.